gentlemen, welcome to Leadership and Politics with Dr. Abraham. With me today on the show is best-selling and award-winning author, Jake Jacobs. Jake, welcome to the show. Nice to see Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abe. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Same here. You are uh, highly recommended. And it is a shame if I don't share your insights with the audience. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Let's delve into it. You have a beautiful book. came out recently. Thank you for sending that. You have a copy of it? I do myself. Let me see it. Yeah. Let me see it. Here you go. Here you go, guys. So we have the author of Leverage Change tonight or today with us. He's going to share the insight of his new book. So tell me about, you're welcome to share some information about you, but tell me about the insight of this book. What is the book all about? Yeah. So the book is about the subtitle. So leverage change is the method and leverage is really important because it's about getting more done with less. Um, so we can talk a little bit about leverage in a minute, but the subtitle to the book is uh, eight ways to achieve faster, easier, better results. So at the end of the day, whatever the results are that you're trying to accomplish, and this will work for individuals, for teams, or for organizations, and I was just on a call with some people around police community relationships, which are really important these days um, in America. But the fundamental issue is how do you achieve results in a way that's faster, easier, and better? And there are eight levers or ways, smart strategic actions I think of in the book that all taken individually or together will get you those results. And each of them addresses a particular issue that people in organizations face when they're trying to create change. And then I designed a lever based on 35 years of experience on the front lines of all kinds of change efforts, um, eight of these strategies to address those problems. Excellent. So in this book, you created a lever with eight leverage thoughts or methods people can use. Absolutely. Well, and, and let me just say why levers and why leverage. And uh, for those who have the video, you can see on the uh, over my back shoulder here is a picture of a man named Archimedes. And Archimedes was a third century Greek mathematician, third century BC. He described leverage in a way that I really liked. And I think it's true for the book, which is give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and single-handed I shall move the world. So I wrote this book with a deep belief that people can move their worlds in the arena of change by using these levers. And by using a good, strong lever, Archimedes could move boulders that the strongest men in the world couldn't budge. And I believe that with the levers in the book, you can achieve changes that you could only imagine beforehand. And again, going back, Dr. Abe, to faster, easier, better being the bottom line here. So we're not just talking about getting the job done, but we're talking about getting it done in a unique way that you, I, and your listeners would be most interested in. So it's an effective way. There is the successful way in this book brings an effective way to managing change. Who is this book ideal for? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you two answers to that. The first one was the one that I wrote the book for. And that is for people leading change work in organizations that are frustrated that the results they're achieving are too slow, too hard, or too often disappointing. So when I say leading change work, it could be um, a manager and their team. It could be looking at multiple leaders of different change efforts in the same organization. So I designed this uh, program. It's a group consultation program, and you could get multiple leaders of different change efforts. And how do you get those efforts aligned is that we, we go through this program together because often change efforts in organizations work at cross purposes. And so the question becomes, that's the first one. Who did I write the book for? It's people who lead change work and they're frustrated. The second one actually came from another podcast. And I will own that this book is for these people too. They said to me, I think you have the next chicken soup for the soul. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? 
Now, I'm pretty quick on my feet, and I think and prepare for these podcasts, but I was not expecting chicken soup for the soul. And so I asked the podcaster, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, have you ever used this book for relationships? I like it. Let me ask you. Let me, let's yeah. give a credit to the podcaster. Who was it? Ah, Ed Everts. Nice. Ed Everts was nice. the one who asked it. And good, good, good. Um, I, I, so, so is it about relationships? And I said, yeah, it should be. Because anywhere you want results, then if you want them faster, easier, and better, the book will help you. So if you're having an issue with a spouse, if you're having some challenges with a teenage child, um, there's a story in the book about a, a leader and their direct report and the relationship that they had and what they needed to do to improve that relationship. It went from this person uh, almost being fired to them being one of the most valuable members of the team. So in that one-on-one -on -one relationship in the workplace, we could see it. And this person was perceptive enough, astute enough to be able to look and say, well, shouldn't you be able to use it in your personal life? So the next book is going to be the Leverage Change Organization and then the Leverage Change Leader. And then Dr. Abe, Chicken Soup for the Leverage Soul. It's coming like it. out to a store near you soon. Actually, I like it. It's a compliment when he addressed it like this. Because when we deal in organizations or family setting, you deal with the relationships. And Absolutely. when you have when you have insights like what you have in your book, you're actually managing the behaviors of these parties to the relationship. What I gathered is you you come from the I to the we in your approach to it. You involve others in your thinking. You don't yeah. say, okay, I think this way and you should do it. You you try to be inclusive of others. Why is that important in dealing with either teams or organization? Right. And, I, and I've worked with um, two kinds of clients, Dr. Abe. One of them, I would call natural participative leaders. And these are folks who just in their DNA, they're about inclusion. And so they draw circles that include people in all of the work that they're doing right? And, and they, they don't have to work at it. They don't have to get trained in it. They, they just, they believe it in their souls and they act in ways that are consistent with that. Okay. That's one kind of client. The other kind of client that I've worked with over the past 35 years is one that's not a natural participative leader, but they're results oriented. And so what they're interested in is getting to the bottom line and beyond. How do we win in the marketplace? And I'm not saying that participative leaders don't want to win in the marketplace, but these are folks, the second group, are not natural participators. They don't draw lines that include people. They're more my way or the highway kind of folks, if you can imagine, right? And they're interested in results. And so I've worked just as well with those kind of people because including people and engaging them meaningfully in their work and in creating their collective future is a better way to get results achieved. And these people have been open. I've had a client of mine who said, look, I don't like all this participation business. I don't even necessarily believe in it, but it works. And so I'm going to use it. And so that's one of those examples where do you need their heart and soul or do you need the behavior? And the behavior was enough that over time, this person came to adopt a more participative approach, but they came to it through the results door. And at the end of the day, this is a win-win. This is a way that you get better retention and recruitment into organizations because you're engaging people and people like to be engaged. And it's a win-win because at the end of the day, you're going to be more successful and effective in your organization, no matter what your mission is. Very true. Very true. This is, this is your third book or second book? This is the third one. This is the third one. You have the books behind you. I do. I had a chance to go and review some of these books. You tap on the previous, basically you have 35 years of experience in consulting sharing with others, teaching executives, and guiding them to be effective. And here you put these thoughts together so you help others. You continue. You're in the service of others, really. Let's, yes. go to, let's go to the previous book you did. 
also you included others. Why is others? I'm still in the same kind of uh, point. Why is involving others is important in yeah, managing so, change? So the other book that we're talking about for your listeners is you don't have to do it alone. How to involve others to get things done. In the very first chapter of that book, Dr. Abe, we said, look, if you don't have to involve people, then don't, right? I mean, it's harder, it takes more time, all these things that are reasons. But if you need to involve them, right, do it well. And so we had a section, the, the people that, that are least likely to be involved in something, we have a name for them in organizations. Uh, they get called troublemakers, troublemakers. Mm. right? And troublemakers are the ones that like, they don't get on board. They have one more question. They have a different perspective on things than everybody else. They're like a thorn in the side. You're like ready to be done with this topic and move on. And they say, I got, I got one more question. And we have trouble with these people, but I think that comes from a misguided paradigm. And what I mean by that is that troublemaking is in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. If I have you be troublemaking, you tend to create trouble. If I have you be a valuable contributor to my team, when you raise that question, when you push us to look at something a little closer, I will see that as a valuable contribution to my team. Yes. So the reason to include people is to get better answers. It's to encourage the troublemakers in your organization to speak up. I talk about in the Leverage Change book that there are four magic words. And those four magic words that if all leaders could learn them, I, I would, uh, I won't say I would retire happily, but if every leader learned these four words and used them, a lot of my work would be done in the world. And they are, could you say more? And what could you say more does is it acts as an invitation to others in the organization to step up and be accountable for their own perspectives. I mean, if you punish people for saying what they think, they will learn not to say anything. But if you come with an invitation, could you say more about that? I, I don't see things that way. I need to understand what you're saying. People will feel freer and freer over time. All of these good outcomes come from welcoming input from others. The feedback of others is very essential in the collaborative efforts. So it's very true. And also you're talking about psychological safety here. So you're saying, Absolutely. you're telling them, hey, you can say anything you want. And I, in my classes, I tell them, don't use the word punishment in dealing with others, just not to reward them anymore. So in a way you're telling them, we're going to reward you regardless. Your feedback is valuable. Yeah, Absolutely. I like it. What else should we know about? Tell me about the lever. Tell me about the lever you had. Yeah. So, so let's pick one of the levers out. Um, they each deal with problems, right? So the problem that a lot of organizations suffer from is change fatigue, right? There's so many changes. There's another reorganization, uh, new technologies, new competitors, new markets. There's always another change coming. And, and I've said this before that, you know, every 10 years, a new futurist comes along and tells us there's gonna be more change in the next 10 years than there were in the previous 100. And then 10 years in the future, somebody else says the same thing. So this is not going away. So how do we deal with change fatigue? Now, most people that you talk to will tell you the answer is less change. If we have too much of something and we're overwhelmed by it, then we need to cut back. Less of it will make it more tolerable for us. But in organizations, we're not looking to be tolerable of things. We're looking to do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing is a number of changes that otherwise, otherwise would be overwhelming. But 
there is a paradoxical approach to this. So when other people, Dr. Aber, are talking about change, what I'm also talking about is what not to change. And I think what not to change is just as important as what we are changing. And if I don't talk about that as a leader, if I don't write that into my memos, use it in my town halls, uh, include it in my conversations and meetings, then people will feel overwhelmed. But what I found is that by including what not to change, and I, I've had meetings where we put flip charts up on the wall and we make lists with an executive committee of all the changes that need to be made in the organization. And as they make this list, you can see them start to slump down in their chair. My, their voice gets a little lower and slower. And you can see the depression sit in just during that meeting. And then I say, all right, let's make another list. This time we're gonna make a list of all those things that we're gonna keep the same, but I want you to make this list twice as long. And as they start making this list of things that are gonna stay the same, they sit up in their chair, the, their voice gets louder, right? They start speaking faster, the depression lifts, and what they see is that a lot of things are gonna stay the same. And we say, what are the things you're doing really well that you wanna make sure you keep doing? The worst thing that happens is during change efforts, dropping the ball on the things that you're already doing well. You're like losing points that you already had put up on the scoreboard because you're not doing them as well anymore. As you start to go forward, there are some things you're gonna to need to let go of. So I'm not saying everything from the past goes forward, but a lot of it does. And when we get in touch with those things, we've got firm ground to stand on, to take a leap into the unknown world of change. And having that firm ground to stand on, I've seen this in organization after organization. In this group consultation program that we have, I have them do the same task. I say, make a list of all of those things that are going to stay the same. And and people are amazed at how long their list is and how empowered they feel at the end of making that list because that's already good work that they've done that they don't have to go back and redo. Change, yes, they need to make, but all those things that stay the same, that's like, if you, if you bet, it's like taking winnings off the table before you even play the first hand. These are things you've done well and you get credit for before you even start your change work. This is an invitation to leaders to look at both sides of the coin. I love it. I, I, I love use it. that same saying, Dr. Abe. It really I gives love it. a fuller picture of reality because if all you're doing is looking at change, that's only part of reality. The other part, the other side of the coin is what you're gonna keep doing that you've always done. And wouldn't it be better to make decisions with all of reality in mind instead of just part of it. Yes. Now, change agents out there. This book is your Bible. You want to change an environment to be effective? Get this book. I like it. I thank appreciate you for, thank that. Thank you for sharing your insights. Where can people find you? Find this book. Uh, if you, well, they can find it at Amazon or their local publisher or indie publishers online. They can also find it at jakejacobsconsulting.com, which is my website. And when they go there, Dr. Abe, there is a free ebook. And nice. I really encourage people to go there and download it. It's called 27 Ways to Achieve Faster, Easier, Better Results Immediately. And so what I've done is for each of the eight levers, we just talked about one of them, there's seven more levers. And for each of the eight levers, there's three or four actions that people can take, like straight away, put the book down, go take the action and get faster, easier, better results. That's wonderful. Thank you for coming. Anything else you want to share before we say goodbye? And I, I think the only thing I would say is encouraging people to embrace change and to take this concept of leverage with smart strategic actions, you can get big things done. And in the book, I talk about how to do that. And there are stories, there are 44 stories in the book of people who've done this work 
and use these levers. So this is not a theoretical piece of work. This is in the trenches, on the front lines, all kinds of organizations, all kinds of change efforts, individual team organization. These levers will work for you if you work with the levers. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. You're most welcome.